The Health Fix Podcast teaches you how to take charge of your health naturally by giving you the information you need to elevate your health. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krauss. Today's episode, you get me all by myself. I'm going to be talking about the vagus nerve. I'm going to talk about vagus nerve infection theory and how I've kind of tied it into what I'm seeing in my office and what we can do to try to mitigate this issue. So why do I want to talk about vagus nerve and how this nerve gets infected? Why does it matter to you? Well, I found out in my practice over time, I've been practicing almost two decades now, and I'm starting to see a pattern. And that pattern is that folks are struggling with multiple viruses, multiple infections within their body, and we're testing, we're finding these, and then we're using a whole bunch of herbs or we're using even pharmaceuticals to try to kill these things, such as multiple gut bugs, multiple viruses, such as Epstein-Barr virus, things of that nature. And all of this killing stuff makes people feel pretty sick and they're not getting better. And that frustrates me because I hate to give people a suitcase full of supplements and herbs and not see any results. And on top of that, they feel like crap. Not cool at all. I've done it. Lots of practitioners do it. And I think we're all kind of at a point where like, what the heck, what is the deal? So I've been diving in to this concept of the vagus nerve infection thing. So it was coined by a researcher. He was a postdoctoral researcher at the time, and now he's a PhD researcher. And, and this happened in 2013. His name's Michael Van Elzacker. So he came up with the vagus nerve infection theory or hypothesis. And, and the idea is that an individual becomes infected with a virus, a bacteria. I'm going to even go with like a yeast, even a, a Lyme disease kind of spirochete type of thing, which is kind of a parasite more or less or any gut bug for that matter. And these bugs stay in the body and the immune system becomes hijacked over time. That hijacking of the immune system over time causes chronic fatigue. And so this is the linking that he had created back in that time that the vagus nerve becomes infected and we get chronic fatigue. I'm going down the lines of chronic fatigue, but I'm also going down the lines of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So this is infection of the thyroid issues in the gut. I'm even going for IBS on this one. Because I am convinced that most of us, our overarching issue that we have is stress. And stress kind of leads us down a pathway of being stuck in fight or flight. And our autonomic nervous system, which is known as the sympathetic and parasympathetic, so it has two divisions. The sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight system. And our parasympathetic is our rest, digest, chill system. Unfortunately, we are stuck in fight or flight a lot of the time because of society. And I've seen a lot more chronic fatigue and a lot more depression and a lot more illnesses get worse in my patients due to COVID. Why? Not that they had COVID. Now I'll talk about those folks in a minute, but they're getting sick due to COVID because they're not socializing. They're not getting out. They're not doing the things that bring them joy. They're stressed. Because let's face it, being in a pandemic is stressful. So we're seeing worsening of symptoms of chronic illness. Now, the other side to this is I'm also seeing folks who were relatively healthy that contracted COVID just go down a really long pathway of illness and start to develop or basically end up with chronic fatigue. It mirrors very coincidentally this concept of the vagus nerve infection theory. Because the COVID virus goes through the whole body and it attacks because of the huge cytokine storm, a lot of the body. And it pretty much, I would say, based on COVID, but any other virus, I'm not going to be specific to COVID even, any other virus is going to live in the system. It hangs out in our nerves. Well, what nerve is most activated in us? Our fight or flight system. Where does the fight or flight system go? Where do all those nerves go in our body? to almost every organ we have. So of course it would make sense that maybe we would have trouble with our digestive system. Maybe we would have trouble with our thyroid. Maybe we'd have trouble making energy because it is in charge of energy regulation in terms of our signaling. So what I'm going for here is is the idea that perhaps we need to be looking at the vagus nerve and looking at how can we de-inflame it over time 
to help us with chronic illness, but also just to preserve life in general. Because if we look at why are we sick, why do we get sick over time and the periods in which we get sick, usually it's following an extremely stressful time. So I want to tell you a little story about myself. I was pushing myself to the limits, trying to impress a new business partner back in the day, trying to really like just crush it in business. But at the same time, I was training for marathons. I was doing all these things. And I had started doing that before I jumped into this new business. So it was already worn out. Now compound all of that stuff and I'm stuck in fight or flight mode. I'm having panic attacks. I'm having trouble even wanting to go into work. What's happening with my system? Well, I'm getting sick a lot. I'm getting cold. I'm not feeling so great. My lymph nodes are swollen in my neck. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Chronic lymph node swelling that goes up and down depending on what's going on in life? Yeah. So this was happening to me over and over again to the point where I was struggling to get through the day. I was falling asleep at like four o'clock in the afternoon, pushing myself with like sugary treats and popcorn and like whatever carbs I could get my hands on, watching my weight go up, watching me not feel so great. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is stress at its most, but what is it doing to my body? Well, my body finally said no and it had had enough when I ended up basically paralyzed in a panic attack on the floor of a concrete parking garage with my face and some oil dry from some oil that had spilled on there. It was awesome. Um, The point being, though, is that it was a big wake-up call. And this has been an overarching theory in my business now. And and what I look at with patients is I don't want anyone to end up where I was, where I couldn't move. I was paralyzed because I, I my body just put me into this freeze mode. It was like, no, you're not going into work. You're not going to do this anymore. You're not going to stress yourself out. Well, what do you think chronic fatigue is? It's your body putting you in freeze mode to try to protect you from whatever stressors are coming at you. Now, how does this tie into the vagus nerve infection theory? It ties in in the fact that if your fight or flight nervous system is on overload for too long, your immune system becomes compromised. And the reason being is because that vagus nerve is in regulation. It regulates how much inflammation goes on in your body. It regulates part of your immune system. If you keep giving your body signals that you are in a stress state, eventually it kind of is like, all right, well, this person is just going to be chronically stressed, so we'll just keep the inflammation going. So you have aches, you have pains, you have IBS. You're fatigued because your body is busy dealing with all of that crap. So you go to the doc and you're like, hey, doc, I don't feel good. And the doc's like, well, let's see what's going on. We test your immune system. We test your white blood cells. Your white blood cells are low. Your vitamin D is low. Then we find that maybe you have chronic Epstein-Barr, which is chronic mono, or you have chronic something called cytomegalovirus. And you're like, I don't even remember getting that. I don't remember having mono. Or maybe you did have mono and now you're you're feeling like it and you're like, yeah, it does feel like that, but not as intense. Yeah. Reactivated mono. These are real things. Or maybe you've been diagnosed with Lyme and you're like, I didn't even know I had a tick bite ever. I've, I've never even been anywhere where there's ticks. Makes you think about how do these things get in the system? Another big one is, is that I see over and over again with patients where their systems go off the rails is tonsils. They will have their tonsils removed because they've had chronic strep throat infections. So strep is a bacteria. Now we're looking at throat things. Now, gut stuff, chronic yeast. Chronic yeast in the gut usually translates to chronic yeast in the sinuses and possibly even in the oral cavity in the mouth. Now, extreme situations, we call it oral thrush, but there's always a possibility for a low level yeast thing going on in the body if we're out of whack, especially if you love sugar and you're stressed out. Yeast loves that environment. So we're looking at how all these chronic infections kind of just get in the system and just linger and linger. A lot of people will have SIBO, small intestine bowel overgrowth, where bacteria are out of control in certain levels in the gut. Why does it keep coming back and no antibiotic, no herb protocol, nothing's working? Because your immune system is compromised due to stress. Your vagus nerve has been infected. Meaning these little buggers can get into that nerve and keep it causing trouble. 
In particular, though, viruses are like the big overarching thing, but I'm postulating the case that quite possibly yeast is a thing. I'm thinking. So I've gone on a little mission in my office to try to take the information that I understand in terms of my theory of the vagus nerve infection and how we can get it to calm down. So the vagus nerve comes out behind your ear in your neck. How many of you have tight necks? A lot of people. So if you get exposed to something, right, that you don't deal well with, like an, uh, an immune system reaction comes up from it, whether it's pollens, whether it's, say, a certain food like dairy, common allergen for folks, corn, soy, eggs, wheat, well, you get a reaction and it kind of stays in the neck, right? Those lymph nodes might swell up. Does that happen to you? If that does, you need to be thinking about this here. That nerve, that nerve is right there in your neck. And so what'll happen is if we have a tight neck because of poor posture and tech neck and stress, because we're waiting for that next bear to pounce on us. So we're wearing our shoulders as earrings and we're all tightened up, curling. I call it armadilloing. If we're like that posturally, we don't get a lot of blood flow in that neck. So if you're exposed to something, maybe it's a bacteria, maybe it's yeast, maybe it's a virus, it's gonna get in via the nose or mouth and come down. And if your neck's tight, we can't like drain that area. So the neck lymph nodes are going to fight the virus. You're going to fight in the tonsils. You're going to fight in, in that area if you have them. If you don't have them, now it's down to the neck. But if your neck's tight and we've got a war going on within the neck and we can't drain that area, what do you think happens? We create inflammation and the cascade of an inflammatory, inflammatory, inflammatory reaction starts within the neck and starts with by the vagus nerve. Now, you might be thinking, okay, doc, you're kind of kooky. Well, let me tell you this. What do I see very often in my office and what am I connecting here? I've got stressed out people who are extremely fatigued, nothing's working to treat them, and they've got chronically enlarged lymph nodes in the neck. I don't know how many people we've ultrasounded lymph nodes, we've biopsied lymph nodes, nothing comes back. They're, they're considered a normal lymph node. It's not lymphoma. They think it is, so that stresses them out even more. But it's nothing. Why is it nothing? It's because these lymph nodes in the neck are not draining because we have tight necks. And then those lymph nodes stay inflamed. And by staying inflamed, they're keeping that virus, bacteria, yeast, whatever it may be, alive in your body. So basically, the vagus nerve infection theory is that your nerve is being hijacked. Your ability to regulate fight or flight response is being hijacked. Now, this might connect for someone out there because I have a lot of folks that come in my office and they're like, Doc, I'm not stressed. I have no idea why my neck is so tight, why I feel on edge all the time. My life's great. Everything's wonderful. Could this explain that? Maybe. The other side of it for me in this case is folks who do come in and they're like, Doc, I'm not stressed. I feel fine. Everything's great in my life. I don't know why I'm so tired. I don't know why I feel like crap. Could it be that the vagus nerve was infected a while ago, the drainage in the neck didn't help to clean that debris out, or the drainage in the belly isn't happening to clean out the leftover debris from the body trying to fight this virus, this bug, whatever it may be. And then what ends up happening is the autonomic nervous system keeps the inflammation going. So... This person doesn't have stress outward. It's inward stress. No amount of breathing, no yoga, no none of these techniques that are supposed to calm our, our sympathetic nervous system will work. So this leads me into, okay, if that's the case, how do we treat it? What do we do about this? Because a lot of folks are using adaptogenic herbs. So things like holy basil, things like rhodiola, things like ashwagandha to try to calm the nervous system down. And in some cases it'll work but other cases it does nothing. So what are we missing? My thought is we're missing working on the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest, the digest, the chill. How do we put someone in that mode more often if someone is stuck in fight or flight? Well, 
I think we have to get to the root here. If we've looked at the lifestyle and we've looked at routines and we've looked at all of that, it's going back to opening up the neck, opening up the lymphatic system, getting things moving. Now, not too long ago, I was on a podcast or I did a podcast rather with, with Jody Cohen from Vibrant Blue Oils here in Seattle. And we were talking about how to open up the neck with essential oils. I like this because it's not a treatment that you have to go to the doctor for. You could do this at home. I love home treatments because you can't come to see me and you can't do acupuncture daily. I would love it if you could. It would be a perfect world. But we've got to stimulate some movement within this neck to get things moving, get things circulating, calming things down. So what I'm proposing is having folks use lime and clove. These are two essential oils combined. Jody has something called parasympathetic, but you could get the individual oils, one drop each with the carrier oil, meaning like jojoba, coconut, and putting it on your neck and tapping behind your ears. There's a little divot. There's a bone back there called the mastoid bone. If you're watching this where you can actually see me moving, um, if you go, I got to move my hair here. Here's my ear and underneath my ear. So if your earlobe's there, you just take your finger behind your earlobe and there's a divot. This is an exact science. If you're close, you're, you're good. That's where that vagus nerve has its most impact. It's called on me on in, in Chinese medicine. This is an extra point that helps with sleep. Hmm. If it's an extra point that helps with sleep and has connection to the vagus nerve, this might be really great to do at night to help you to sleep. If you're stuck in fight or flight, you're feeling chronically fatigued and you have insomnia. So you can do both of these points at the same time. You're just rubbing them. Because essential oils need targeted locations. If you put essential oils into the air, they're nice for mood. They're nice for helping respiratory, but they're not going to get targeted results. If you want parasympathetic response, you need to put the point, get the oils to the points that matter. So on me on behind the ear, like I said, earlobe and go behind. Then halfway down, there's a point called deja. This is another extra point in Chinese medicine. And literally the way to find it is from on me on, so your ear bone point to the top of your shoulder, measure halfway, boom, that's Deja. One side at a time because you don't want to compress any circulation. And then you're holding it, you're wiggling your finger, or you can do like clockwise motion. And I recommend like 30 to 60 seconds there. Chances are that point's going to be kind of sore for you. Then the next point is coming down and you're literally finding your collarbone and about an inch above your collarbone, you're going to dig in, you're going to find a sore spot. That is called lotion. That is a point that opens up your scalenes in your neck. It's an extra point. Hold that sucker 30, 60, 60 seconds or rub it only one side at a time. If you do both sides, you're going to cut off your circulation and you're not going to like me. I don't want anybody passing out. <laughs> we do not need any, any incidents or anyone getting into trouble by doing some acupressure. So there you go. Hold that point. Last point, halfway on the collarbone here, you got your collarbones. Just literally from that low gen point, just go straight down where your fingers touch there on the collarbone. That is a lymphatic drainage point. Chinese medicine wise, it's known as stomach 12. You can hit that point right there. And honestly, you can kind of go all like above and below and just kind of go around the collarbone there. I think just that whole area, targeting that whole area of the collarbone is nice. Not even being specific to the acupuncture point, but the point is, is it's good for lymphatics. Now, after you've done that 30 to 60 seconds at each of those points, take your hands and just brush down. Brush down three to six times. This is going to stimulate the lymph to move in the neck. Boom, done. Every night, every morning, you could do that if you want. That's one way to help release the congestion in the neck. Now, you might be asking in your head, like, well, how, do, how, how does that even work to get the infection out of there? The idea is we remove the inflammatory proteins that keep building up in the area to keep telling that vagus nerve it needs to keep staying, you know, basically staying inflamed. We're not going to kill the virus. We're not going to kill the bacteria. We're going to let the body take care of that once we put the fire out. How do we put fires out? We get circulation moving. That's how we get it going here. So the whole concept that I've got started for folks is getting circulation moving in your neck, getting the lymphatic flow going in your neck. Now, while you're doing that, there's other things that you can do to help your body get into parasympathetic mode more often. 
So let's talk about that. I have a free course that's going to be coming out. It's a mini course, and it's all about setting your routine so that you reset and you recover from every stressor and every single day. Because most of us are stuck in fight or flight because we are not taking the time to put ourselves in chill mode enough. For some reason in America, we've got it all wrong. Push, 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 drive, 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 get that dream. And then it kills us. Because when we're stuck in fight or flight mode, we're messing with our autonomic nervous system and its ability to beat your heart properly. If you have a high heart rate, you are going to have a likelihood that you are going to die earlier. You want your base heart rate to be lower. Now, there are caveats in terms of folks who have metabolic diseases, things of that nature, where the heart rate is kept low by the body because it's stuck in freeze mode. That's a whole nother thing. That's another podcast. I'm not going to get into that. But for those of you that have a higher heart rate on a daily basis, and I'm talking about heart rates that are above 80, 75, 80 on, on average, you, you want to get your heart rate down 55 or below to be cardiovascularly sound. Now, I'm going to eventually work on some programs where I can help you to do that with some cardiovascular training. But my first step is to get you chill throughout the day because we can't like put the cart before the horse. I'm not going to have you trying to work out physically too hard if we haven't looked at your routines throughout the day. So my course Reset and Recovery is all about looking at your routines throughout the day, looking at what you're doing from when you wake up to when you go to bed and inserting some chill. Because the more predictable that you are for your nervous system, the less it's going to be stressed out. So I have people set meal times. I don't care if you're intermittent and fasting, fine. Just eat at the same times during the day, more or less, within minutes. Don't stress yourself out by like, it's two o'clock and I'm not right home and I'm gonna be home by 205 and doc said I need to have my food right at two. No, a couple minutes, fine. But keep it in mind that if you give your body a routine, it's going to follow it and it's gonna like it. You have to train yourself. You trained yourself to be the person you are now. You can untrain yourself. You can retrain yourself to be someone amazing. Not that you aren't now, but even better. Let's put it that way. Always strive to be getting better. Always strive to be better. That's the point here. So breakfast, lunch, dinner, if you do that, set some meal times. Go into bed and wake up, set those times. Then create morning routines that have you chill. Create evening routines that have you chill and take breaks throughout the day. That's kind of the summary of the course. But during my course, I tell you a little bit more detail on how to do it. But what I'm getting at here is little things so that you can put yourself into parasympathetic mode a little bit more. We're not taught this in grade school, high school, college. We should be. We should be taught it as soon as we get into preschool, I think. Really. Because if we were a a group of individuals that knew how to self-soothe in healthy ways, healthy ways, not food, not alcohol, not sugar, not drugs, you name the addiction, that's self-soothing. And most of the time, that's our coping mechanism for stress. We need to really start thinking about how can we put ourselves into parasympathetic mode more often. Now, If you are someone that struggles with IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome, or any chronic gut issues, listen up. Chances are, this is also an autonomic nervous system issue like I mentioned before. Because your gut is your first brain. This is your second brain. Your brain's your second brain. So your autonomic nervous system touches every single area of your small intestine, your large intestine, your colon, I mean, your stomach, everything. It touches all of it. And of course, if you're stuck in fight or flight mode, you're going to have trouble. You're going to. And sometimes we'll change all our diets up. We'll have people avoiding foods. I've done it. I'm guilty of it. And, and sometimes folks who have IBS hate food because it's, it's been kind of their crux their whole life. That's not cool. We should be enjoying food. We should have an enjoyable experience. But now we need to kind of look about what's going on when we eat. If you're on the run, you're on the go when you're eating, what do you think happens with that food? It's not going to get digested. It's not going to get, it's not going to do what it needs to do for you. So I highly recommend after this podcast, 
every single time you eat, spend 60 seconds just sitting before you actually start to put the food in. Just breathing, just sitting. Maybe you say thank you to the universe or whoever you are are thankful to for the food. And you just sit with it. We need to learn to slow down a little bit. We need to really send the messages to your brain that there is no freaking bear chasing it. There's nothing after it. When we slow down, we get a lot more quality digestion. When we slow down and take breaks in the day, we don't have as much brain fog or confusion because most of the time brain fog and confusion gets blamed on hormones. And yes, it can be, but a lot of the time it's because your brain's overwhelmed because you have too much crap in your head. You got to release some of these things. A lot of people roll their eyes when I say journal and, you know, it, it just helps to get things out of your brain. But I do like midday breaks where either you journal, you breathe, you go play soccer for a minute. I kick a soccer ball around in my office. I say it all the time. I also hula hoop in my office. You want proof? Come to my office. It's there. It's totally there. I got the pleasure of playing with one of my client's kiddos the other day, hula hooping and playing soccer. And it was a joy. So these types of things are great to have around because they're just fun. And we all have forgotten about how much we used to play or enjoy play. We've suppressed our inner child. And that also jacks with your autonomic nervous system. Because when you can't be who you really want to be or you're, you're not expressing who you want to be, think about all of what that does to your nervous system. So I've given you some, some hints here in terms of opening up that neck. Because I do think the neck is quite a bottleneck, literally. In, in terms of things. And Jody Jody said it on our previous podcast about oils. You know, this is a bottleneck. This is where everything gets stuck. I think the other bottleneck is the gut. So I mentioned the clove and lime in the neck. Now I'm going to mention working on your belly. So to get proper motion on your belly, you want to target certain points. Makes sense, right? So I want everybody to find their belly button right now. I'm not going to show the belly button because it'll probably get censored or something because it's body parts. So find your belly button, tickle your belly button for a second. And I want you to take two fingers. So two fingers, here's belly button, put two fingers out from your belly button. There's a point right there. It's called stomach 25. It's one of the most amazing points for digestion. So belly button, two fingers, either side. This is stomach 25. Great point. Put some lime and clove oil on that sucker. Hold those points. You could do clockwise, you could do don't do counterclockwise. Do clockwise or just kind of shake the point if you want or just press the point. 60 seconds. You go out from there. Another finger width. We got spleen 15. That's a point that's great for helping you to absorb nutrients. The spleen and stomach are your digestive points in the Chinese world. So belly button. And either side of it. Now we got one more point I want you guys to, to work with here. Your rib cage comes down like so. And you've got that center of your rib cage. A lot of folks call it the, well, it's called the xiphoid process, but a lot of folks will, will call it the solar plexus. There's this little bone right there. Take your fingers about two fingers over and you got a point here. This is stomach 19. I like it on the left in particular because that's where the stomach's at. I want you to find the end, bottom of your rib cage. Just poke around, find your rib cage. You're going to find that xiphoid process, and I want you to put two fingers, and then I want you to run your fingers over and find a tender spot in there. You could try it on the right side too, but I like the left just because, like I said, that's where the stomach is. Press that point, hold it 30 seconds with the lime and clove. Then, when you're done with those, move it upwards. Move it upwards because you need to put that lymph into the heart. It dumps into the heart to get cleared. So, Moving upwards, take your two hands like this from your belly and just move up, move up. That will help you to clear some of the lymphatic gunk. Now, another big thing that I learned at Bastier that was quite cool is, is castor oil packs. This is using castor oil with a rag on top because castor oil ruins anything it comes in contact with and put a heat pack on top. 20 minutes like that, you could do then your essential oils and then lymphatic 
three to six movements like this of moving the hands up towards your heart from pelvic bone down here all the way up. It's a great way to get the lymphatic flow going in your belly. So if you have SIBO, you have yeast issues in your belly, you have IBS, this is a great game-changing thing to get the lymphatics moving in your gut, especially if you know you process your emotions there. This is a big deal, big, big, big deal. Now, if you also notice that you're quite tight on your rib cage, you can also make some motions with your hands to go this way and move up and get the lymph moving here. You could take the oil, move it up. I highly recommend targeting these spots, though, with the oil, not just diffuse oil, because diffuse oil is not going to get results. You need targeted spots. Now, with that clove and lime, you can also pair in other types of oils to help you out, especially if you're someone that's that's really, really stressed out. There's a couple companies that have something called Copaiba that can be helpful. I also recommend frankincense, especially if you get some belly stuff around your period. That's useful to add in there too. So keep those guys in mind. And then of course, Vibrant Blue Oils has spleen and stomach, uh, or spleen, not stomach, but a spleen and a liver and a gallbladder uh, oil. So these can be things you can move, use too for, for specific targeting and, and mix and match there. So something to think about. But the point being here is for you to take the time to do this, guess what? You're relaxing. Oh, you're taking a break. So it's kind of a two for one because not only are you giving your body the signals to move circulation and clear the lymph in the gut, you're also doing something that you're breathing, you're relaxing, helping that autonomic nervous system. And the more you can do that over time, the more you get into parasympathetic mode, the stronger it's going to become, the more the body's going to want to be in that mode. Huge. So my proposal for everyone out there in terms of the overarching theme of today is that the vagus nerve infection concept or theory can be mitigated by helping to put your body into parasympathetic mode more often, but also helping your body to clear inflammation. How do we do that? Clear the lymph out improve circulation. Huge concepts here because most of us, when we are stressed out, we're stuck. Our blood doesn't move well. Our neck, like I said before, crunched up, arched, rolled over. Belly, those belly muscles, you might find that on the edge of your rib cage, you're super tight. Why do you think that is? You're protecting. You might even find that your hip flexor, so if we go to the hips down here, you might even find your hip flexors are tight too. So I highly recommend Exploring your body. See where you're tight. Now, I didn't mention breathing because breathing's overdone at this point. But breathing and seeing where you feel stuck can also give you a really, really good sense of where you want to put some oils and where to focus. Kind of taking big breaths in and big breaths out and trying to expand your rib cage in all of the directions, not just belly breathing in one because that can compress your back and cause more trouble. So if you feel like you're breathing and you're not getting there and you don't feel relaxed, think about expanding both ways, anterior, posterior, but also sideways too when you breathe. But that's a whole nother podcast for another day. So folks, if you're digging this and you want to learn more, hit me up because this is stuff that I'm really geeking out with. I'm in my office. I'm doing a lot of acupuncture related to lymphatic drainage. If you are not in the Tacoma, Washington or Renton area where I'm at, Shoot, hook up with your acupuncturist and get them to start working on your lymph and helping you to get blood flow going and get things unstuck because one of the best ways to help with circulation on a deep level where you can kind of get into parasympathetic chill mode is to have acupuncture. Seriously, it's an hour where you can't do anything because you got needles in you forced rest, but it's also really awesome for your body because we suck at circulation as humans and acupuncture can be amazing to help induce circulation. And if you get circulation going, lymphatic drainage goes with it. Huge concept here. Now, yes, there's a lot of herbs that could be used internally and there's a lot of great products out there. Cellcore has amazing lymphatic drainage stuff. You can check them out online. But the thing here, and I'll put it in my notes at drjkrausnd.com, but the thing here is external stuff often works better because it's 
stimulatory on a different level. It's stimulating your cells. And it's also for your body, it's a signal that you can take the time to take a break because too many people are popping the lymphatic herbs or the the supplements and they're just go, 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 do, do, do. This is a two for one. You're slowing yourself down and you're moving circulation and the lymph. So what are you doing when you leave here and stop listening to this podcast? You're going to go and work on stimulating your lymph and your circulation in your body to help de-inflame your body so that vagus nerve isn't inflamed all the time, sending inflammatory signals that keep you with all these viruses and bugs. Help your system out. It'll help you out. Okay, folks, you have survived another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause. Please comment. Let me know what you think about this subject. I want to hear what you're thinking. I want to hear if you try this. I want to hear everything because this is a big study for me right now, and I am hitting it hard in the office, and I would love to hear what you guys are doing on the street out there. All right. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. Hey, health junkies, I hope you enjoyed my podcast. If you want to continue the conversation based on what topic I'm talking about at any given time on the Health Fix podcast, head over to my Facebook group, Find Your Health Fix. It's where we are talking about what's going on in health, what I'm talking about in the podcast, and I love to answer questions there. So come hang out and join the conversation. And by the way, right now I have a free Manage Your Stress Naturally course that you can grab on my website at drjkrausnd.com because so many people are stressed out right now and really it has to do with the basics, your routines and simple habits that are messing you up. So head on over to drjkrausnd.com and go check out my free course on managing stress naturally. All right, folks, have a great day, whatever you're doing. Subscribe, rate, and share info. 